Hey folks, I'm Demotro, and today I want to tell you about a sequence of numbers that's pretty underrated in terms of how useful and fundamental it is, and it relates to factors of numbers in a way that's similar to the classic sequence of numbers known as factorials so much that I feel like this is the sequence that should have been called factorials. That one should have had some other sort of name, perhaps. But in any case, this sequence, which doesn't even have a common classic nickname, just a mathematical way to describe, we can see does start similarly to these other sequences, the factorials, where you multiply all of the whole numbers up to some point. So for example, one, and then one times two, one times two times three, and etc. And there's their friend, the primorials, where you just multiply the prime numbers up to some point. And often it's better to just write these with each number appearing once, just showing each new distinct primorial, meaning like I just would have two, six, 30, two, 10 in my sequence and so on. But here I did list every single one we would get if we counted the primorial up to some certain whole number. And for the first term, we do get a one there because although one does not have any prime factors, when we're multiplying an empty amount of things, we actually wanna list the empty product, which is the multiplicative identity. But if that part's confusing, you can pretend we started with the second term. And here we're looking at it like, there is all the primes up through two multiplied, all the primes up through three multiplied, and all the primes up through four doesn't change anything, for example. Now here, in their underrated friend, we can see that we have a different sort of repetition. We do have some numbers repeating, but not identically to the primorials. And we can also see that this underrated sequence has some classic numbers in it. It starts with these amazing ones, one, two, and six, numbers that just break so many records for divisibility and moves on to some other quite divisible numbers, including a super clock string right here. 12, 60, 60. It's like the amount of hours on a clock, the amount of minutes on a clock, and the amount of seconds on a clock. And then we get a classic meme number, and then we get some more divisible things. Now, what is this sequence? And why do I think that it would more properly deserve the name factorial? Well, remember factor, which is in here, in the context of basic number theory, means numbers that we could divide another number by without getting a remainder. Like the factors of six are one, two, three, and six, or sometimes you would also list the negative versions of those. Now with the factorials, one thing that does make it somewhat make sense that they have factor in their name is that since we're building them by taking one times two times three to the whole thing times four to the whole thing, or could be seen as taking an individual one and multiplying all the whole numbers to that point, obviously each one will be divisible by all the numbers up to whatever it's the factorial of. For example, that six factorial, obviously it'll be divisible by one through six because we made it by multiplying those numbers together. However, that's not the first one that's divisible by one through six. If we look at the number 120, that is also divisible by one through six, and that's the fifth factorial. So the fifth factorial ends up getting a bit ahead, and then we don't really need six factorial if we were trying to have a number that was divisible by the first six numbers. So what if we just cared about that like reduced, more efficient version of the factorials? The first number that was divisible by one, the first number divisible by one and two, then divisible by one, two, and three. Well, it would quickly diverge from the factorials as we see because that is this sequence here. 
Now, first of all, about this other sequence, if we look at more terms of it, we can see some new numbers that we might not have realized are really divisible in a certain fundamental way. Not the same way that numbers like highly composite numbers, which break records for the total amount of divisors for a number based on its size, not the same as that sort of measure of divisibility, but there could be some circumstances where being able to divide by all the whole numbers up to some point could come in handy. Let's say you were planning a party and you didn't know how many people were gonna show up, but it was gonna be up to some certain number that you expected as the maximum, and you wanted to make sure that regardless of how many people were there, you were able to divide things in some way or another. Well, there are many circumstances where we could see this emerge. The fact that that is the smallest number that has a factor of one. That is the smallest one that can be divided by one or two. Here we have one, two, or three. And it's not necessarily all of the factors of the number. Like here we have one, two, three, four, and then some others, but we don't have five in that one yet. And you've probably noticed that 60 is very divisible. It is the reason why it's chosen for things like clocks, that it can be divided by so many things, and maybe even that extra fact that it's the smallest number divisible by not only one through five, but also one through six. And 420 is the smallest whole number divisible by one through seven. And then we meet some more numbers that are, in my opinion, underrated to a degree. Some of these do also show up on other classic lists, but not all of them I had ever realized we're part of such a special divisibility club. Currently, the best way to describe this sequence is similar to how factorials are multiplying all of the whole numbers up to some point n, and primorials multiply all the primes up to some number n. This one is the least common multiple of all of the whole numbers up to some point n. As a quick reminder, the least common multiple of a set of numbers is sort of a friend of the trait of the greatest common denominator of some set of numbers. With the greatest common denominator, we take some set of numbers and look for the number that's the largest one that each of them could be divided by and still get a whole number. Whereas in this case, with the least common multiple, we're looking for a number that is the smallest number that it could be divided by each of them. Like if I had the least common multiple of four and 10, well, they have a factor of one of the twos that makes up the four in common. So we basically have two twos plus the five that was missing, but the two was already covered there. So that would be 20. And these are also just able to be seen as the smallest whole number that could be divided by each of these without a remainder or the smallest whole number with each of these as factors. And it's a very natural question that does emerge sometimes to ask something like, what's the least common multiple of like, all of the whole numbers up to 30 or something. And that would be the 30th term on this list. Now we can pretty easily define this sequence, but would it be easy to construct it? Like how do we know that going from 12 to 60, the 60 is gonna stick, but then the 420 is gonna come after that sticks once. If we look at a longer list, we can see many of them stick for varying amounts and others of them only have once and the pattern there relates to when we're going in this range up through that number n how many different prime factors we need to collect and the simplest way to calculate that for a given n would be to look at all of the largest of the prime powers we want the biggest power of each prime so, for example, a prime power could be something like two, which is two to the first power, or it could be some other prime to some positive integer as an exponent, one, two, etc. 
And here with the prime powers, which are like the primes, but some extra, if I wanna go up to say the 30th one of these, the easiest way to calculate it is to look at what are the prime numbers in this range? What is the largest power of each of those that's in the range? And then multiply those together. Like here, if I wanted to do the fifth term, all of the prime numbers up through there are two, three, and five, but I can also fit a two squared there, and the others I can only fit a first power of. Nine, which is three squared, or 25, which is five squared, would be too big to fit within the first five numbers. And this together ends up giving me 60 that built that term. And we can see clearly that if I had needed to do that for the first six numbers, there would be no new prime powers that were larger than a previous one to instead include as the exponent on a given prime. And there wouldn't be a prime with the first power that would appear. We're adding the sixth term, and that means two times three, which we already in a more casual sense had covered from the second and third term. We already collected them, you could say. Or if you were trying to calculate all the terms up to some point, the quickest would be to do it in a recursive way where you keep the list and as you build it, you reference the previous term and then just take the previous term we see here and then the next whole number of which term we're now at and see, does that new term add a new prime power or not? If it doesn't, we repeat the last term. And if it does, we multiply it by that prime just once because the new prime power we encountered will be one larger of an exponent than the previous prime power that was already in there. Or in the case of it being a prime itself, then we would add a new one. Basically still adding one to the exponent by taking it from a zeroth power of the prime, because secretly I like to think that prime factorizations do have every prime in them, just the vast majority are to the zeroth power, making that part equal to times one. In any case, the fact that prime powers are so related means something interesting about when these terms repeat or don't. Now, with the primorials, we'll notice that there would be, as we go along looking at more and more primorials, times where we see longer and longer strings of one repeating. Those would be at prime gaps where there's a bunch of composite numbers in a row between two primes, which are related to many mysteries of primes that linger throughout these sequences, even the factorials as well, and make it so even if these sound simple in some ways, they do have many open questions because the primes have many open questions, particularly about things like where and when do prime gaps exactly occur? Now, with prime gaps, I have shown before, it was one of the first episodes on my main other combo class channel, that you can prove pretty easily that you will have arbitrarily large prime gaps. That means that you can pick any finite sized whole number, a billion, a trillion, whatever, and somewhere on the number line, there will be a prime gap at least that big. We wouldn't say that there are infinitely big gaps because there are more primes. There's an infinite amount of primes, but they can be bigger than a million numbers apart, bigger than a trillion numbers apart, or somewhere on the number line, a gap bigger than whatever finite number you wanna choose. So what that means is that there will be points in the primorial sequence where one of these terms repeats an arbitrarily long amount of times. 
Meaning, let's say I pick the number 1 billion, somewhere in the infinite primordial sequence, when we write it this way, where we're saying all of them up through 5 and all of them up through non-primes like 6. Now with this sequence, it's similar to the primordials, but a little different because this changes whenever we encounter a new prime, and whenever we do, it multiplies it by that prime, whereas this one changes whenever we encounter a new prime power, and similarly just multiplies it by that prime once that was the prime at the heart of the prime power, because the number had already collected all of the lower exponents of the prime by that point. And so I had to look up to check are there times where this sequence occurs for an arbitrarily long string? And it turns out it has been proven there are arbitrarily large gaps between the prime powers, which is harder to prove than just for the primes because there are more prime powers than just primes, yet they still have that trait where you can find points on the number line where they're more than a billion apart or more than a trillion apart. So we would find times in this infinite sequence where some numbers would repeat more than a billion times or more than a trillion times. Now, if we wondered about the opposite, how much can numbers be different in a row? How many numbers can we see that are distinct from each other in a row before something repeats? Well, looking just here is kind of a trick. A lot of times a sequence has traits that you don't see until you zoom out a bit, because here it looks like it's more common for them to change right away and just sometimes stick. But on the bigger scale, we can have the ones that stick up to an arbitrarily large amount, whereas the maximum amount of terms that are ever different in a row in this sequence is five right there. Now there are several ways we could define or describe this sequence, but the most intuitive one is probably to think of it as the nth term is the smallest whole number that has one through n as factors. It seems like this is a more factor-related version of factorials. So I sort of feel like this one would have better deserved the name factorials, and these should have been called like the naturials or naturorials or something, because they're all of the natural numbers, although not including zero, so maybe we can call them the whole orioles, or leave a comment what you think those should be called. I do have some thoughts of potential nicknames for these, as well. Here are some of the nicknames. I figured that they're more compact, efficient versions of these, so we could call them something like the compactorials, or we could call them similar to primorials, which they also have a lot in common with, the prime powerials, or here are some other suggestions of potential nicknames for this. The reason I'm going so hard on that nickname aspect of this is that I genuinely think that these have become more well-known and understood by non-mathematicians or perhaps people just slightly getting into math for the first time, whereas this lies beneath the surface partially due to not having a good nickname. This one's not even inherently that much harder to describe than something like the primorials, and it does have a lot of other cool traits in common with these. Each of these types of sequence sort of maximizing the efficiency of some certain traits about numbers, and in this one, I feel like it's a decently important trait. I can imagine several circumstances where you might need to divide things up related to some quantity that you didn't know exactly what number it would be, but knew it would be up to some maximum that it wouldn't be larger than. And if you wanted to make sure your divisibility works for that range, you might want something like that. In any case, let me know what you think and make sure you've also checked out the big project I released recently on my main other combo class channel about how the last month 
I found tons of four leaf clovers and some other really rare things. So that's linked in the description. Make sure you check that out at some point. Even if you normally only care about my math content, I really think you will enjoy parts of that. Anyway, thank you for watching. Special thanks to the people who help support on ways like Patreon or the YouTube memberships on this channel. And do make sure you are checking out my videos on the other main Combo Class channel as well. Anyway, thank you for watching. I love you and I will see you again soon.